Good evening and welcome. This is our third session for the Transit Citizen Leadership <coughs> Academy and you all are in for a real treat tonight. One of our sponsors for this event is HDR ICA and Stan King is the Vice President of that organization. They are transport in the transportation <laughs> business. So we're very excited. They have brought our speaker in tonight. And I think you'll be very pleased because he has lots of real life experiences to share with you. We are recording this session tonight. That's why you see the videographer in that. If you ask a question tonight, I have asked them to please repeat it so that we make sure it's on the video. So when he responds, they understand what he's responding to. But please talk up and talk loudly if you ask a question to make sure everybody can hear what is being said. Stan, I'm gonna let you come and introduce our guest, Tai Wu. And I'm not gonna butcher your last name, I'm gonna let Stan you say do it. <laughs> yeah, you butcher it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well Thank you, Joanne. It really is a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Uh, it was about two years ago uh, that I was uh, finishing my class time with the Transit Citizen Leadership Academy. And I can tell you that the, the, the experience was very beneficial to me, uh, both professionally and, uh, and just with the networking opportunity and learning more about uh, transit and the needs that we have in our community for finding solutions for our transportation uh, needs as we move forward and to continue to grow. Uh, you know, reflecting back on the discussion two years ago, and what it is now, it's very, it's, uh, it's very open discussion now. Um, and, but some of the issues are still the same, and there's a lot of challenges. Uh, but I see now that at this point in our, in, in our evolution in this discussion, uh, it's such a great time to be looking forward at an opportunity to make a difference, and, and make a difference in solving some of these problems so that the next generation uh, can look back and say thank you for, for making those tough choices. And it starts with being able to communicate with the people that we interact with every day. Uh, I actually live in Murfreesboro. And uh, the people I talk to and, and you communicate with them in my family, uh, in my church, and the people that my kids go to school with, we have this transit discussion now that we didn't have three years ago, four years ago. Uh, and it's, it's uh, my experience with this Leadership Academy has provided me the opportunity or the ability to articulate what everyone in this room knows is our needs for real transportation solutions that uh, will prevent us from becoming the next Atlanta, and that's the, the, the catchphrase that you hear over and over again. So it's, it's a great opportunity for us to look forward and then look for those solutions. Uh, HDR, uh, ICA has been uh, in Tennessee since uh, 1995. We opened an office here under the name of Florence and Hutchison in Nashville. Uh, four years ago, we were acquired by a firm out of, uh, that was a tech order in Missouri called ICA. Uh, and uh, we've always been a transportation firm, an engineering firm providing design, survey, and geotechnical construction phase services for road projects that probably we, you guys have driven on uh, many times in our Middle Tennessee region. Uh, it was uh, early this year that we were acquired by HDR. Uh, HDR is a much larger firm. They're about a 10,000 member firm. Uh, they have offices uh, across, uh, really across the world. Uh, and they do a lot of transit planning, uh, transit design projects. Uh, and for that reason, uh, we are just really proud to be able to present to you today uh, one of our experts, which is Tyro Jaiba. I got it right. Uh, I've known Tyro for, I guess now, the better part of six months. Uh, and I've just learned how to pronounce his name, his last name. <laughs> I was not going to shy away from that. Anyway, Tyro is, uh, is an expert. He really is in uh, planning and implementation of transit projects. Uh, he served as a director uh, for the Sacramento uh, Regional Transportation District, uh, similar to our RTA. Uh, he has served as a planning director at the Interurban Transit Partnership in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, he's kind of been in those positions where <clears throat> tough decisions about projects and, uh, and prioritiz prioritizing uh, investments that had to be made. And he uh, has since been in the private sector with us uh, developing projects for clients just like we have here in Nashville with the MPO, uh, Trans MTA, and RTA. Uh, 
with 24 years of transit experience uh, with a variety of different types of projects, BRT, everybody's familiar with that from the AMP uh, project that was uh, recently pursued, uh, rail projects, uh, and streetcars, and other types of bus projects too. So uh, I think you're gonna really enjoy listening to, to uh, Tyler's presentation. Uh, and please feel free uh, to look at more information that we've laid there uh, in the form of a handout about our firm. Uh, and during the presenta presentation, don't, don't hesitate. If you have a question, uh, just go ahead and fire them away at, at Tyler. He's uh, uh, ready to, to just respond to your needs today and, and give you as much information as you can. So if you will, please uh, uh, welcome Tyler. Thank you. <coughs> Appreciate that. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to come today and share with you. So um, my name is Taiwo, which means a twin, um, really. But um, a lot of what I do, I, my parents used to tell me that when I was little, I was always interested in how ants move around. And I always wanted to know where they were going and where they were coming from. And so I studied geography and then I went ahead and did planning, but I thought it wasn't enough. So when I was working for the city of Sacramento, my job was basically to process entitlements, special permits, zoning, applications, and things of that nature. And pretty soon, I thought, you know, I'm doing the same thing over and over again. Um, but my passion is really in mobility, transportation. And so as soon as I had an opportunity, I went ahead and joined the Sacramento Regional Transit District. and. Um, Part of our focus, really, do you have a transportation planner who has a background in city or urban planning? And that was very helpful for me because it also meant that when developers are thinking about putting something along a transit corridor, I have to think about density. I have to think about vertical development. I also have to think about its impact on transit. I also have to think about whether we have to shift the location of a bus stop or shelter or we keep it where it is. And so I wasn't just a transit planner that thinks about moving people. I also had to think about making the shelter or stop a destination, an experience for people. So my interest was not just about building a line where people would travel or having a mode that would move people. I wanted people to have an experience because that was very important. And that every planner wants people to have an experience. Transportation planners want to move people. And so I felt that I was privileged that I have both. Um, and so I started as a planner, I worked on environmental work, I worked on light rail projects, I worked on moving bus shelters and, and things like that. Then eventually became the administrator of the transit oriented development for the same agency. Then at the end of the day, they also had me manage a light rail extension as a planner overseeing an engineering work. And then um, at that point in time, I thought I had done a little bit of work in, in light rail and streetcars, BRT not that much. So when I had an opportunity to manage one of the first successful bus rapid transit projects in the country, I, um, I went to Michigan with the very first BRT system in the state. And um, I thought that for a, a conservative leaning state, especially in Grand Rapids, I'd like to see exactly you know, what the thought was uh, with regards to that. So I did. And um, not only did I help to move that bus rapid transit system from the environmental and planning stage into construction, I actually also helped to build it and to start it. And so it finally opened August of last year. Um, and I had a situation in my family that really made me to move to Georgia. And so I started to live in Atlanta. Um, yeah, that's a different story. Um, <laughs> so I still do business in Atlanta. I actually manage the 22-mile belt line, Atlanta belt line, uh, which was a combination of uh, uh, transit, trails, and parks. I manage that. And then HDR felt that they needed my help in the Carolinas uh, to really help to deepen our, uh, 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 you know, our work in the Carolinas. So I still do a lot of work in Atlanta. As a matter of fact, I will be there on Friday. But now my base for the last three months has been in Charlotte. Uh, over the last few months, I'm no stranger to Nashville. I've actually been coming here for the last two years. Uh, I remember my first trip to Nashville was taking a mega bus from Atlanta uh, to, uh, to Nashville. 
I was able to access Wi-Fi and, and you know do all of the, the good stuff. Um, so I'm a transit geek. Uh, I, I, I love what I do. And I actually tell people that I don't have a job. I've been playing this for quite a while. I love it. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I, I really love what I do. Um, now, when I came then, I became very familiar with the, the downtown area, but I also became quickly familiar with congestion. Um, because I remember the second trip I made, I rented a car. And, um, you know, <laughs> driving on High 24 wasn't particularly very easy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, but over the last few months, especially since we've, um, we've been with ICA, um, HDR, together with Nelson Nygaard, started teaming on the, uh, the second phase of the in motion. Uh, the second phase of the in motion is really to identify seven corridors for high capacity transit and then to do a conceptual design and engineering for that. And so I am leading that on behalf of HDR, where I sub to Nelson Nygaard. I've been working with folks from Nelson Nygaard for as long as I've been in the United States, actually great folks, great group of people. And so um, I've been coming and I've uh, noted a few things that I thought uh, are not different from other communities that I've been, and, and uh, some that are different from other communities that I've been. So as I share with you today, I don't want to claim that I know your community. You know it better than I do, because you've lived here, you walk here, you play here. Uh, but I will share a few things with you that I think you can take away from here and can influence your communities uh, respectively um, with that. So with that, I will. I'm so sorry. OK. I just realized that we were up for the PowerPoint because it's after 9.40. OK, that's fine. So while they're doing that, I would say that I want to talk about shaping the future of transit um, in Nashville. They often say that transit will fulfill two purposes. It's either going to be city serving or city shaping. But I think transit can do both. It can both shape a city and it can serve. Because in the process of serving, it can actually shape the environment. And so many times we outbuild ourselves by just, you know, we lay this roadway here, we lay that roadway there, and we just keep sprawling. And the interesting thing is that transit has to follow that shape. And in the process, it doesn't do a good job. Whenever transit has to follow development, it never does good work. I, I remember very well um, as uh, working on the client side and as, as a, a, a public agency and people will come to me and they will say, usually the federal agencies will come to me and they will say, we want to locate the Social Security Administration office over there. They've already done it, by the way. Uh, but we would like you guys to move a bus service over there. And the interesting thing is you can't just move a bus. You know, y you've got to take service from some people to this location. And in the process, you're going to have some people are going to get mad because you're now serving. Usually, I hear this request from IRS and Social Security Administration. They will have done it, and then they will come to you and say, can you serve? So transit not only should serve a city, but she should also shape a city. It should shape the way we grow. It should shape the places people, people do things around. Um, I remember very well that I would drive to work, and it was easy for me whenever my car had a problem. I would drive straight to, my, to the auto mechanic, jump on bus route 41, which passes right in front of the auto mechanic to go to my office, and I would call them a few hours later, is my car ready, jump on the bus, go pick my car. So it was very easy for me to do that type of thing, or go to a doctor's appointment. Of course, I'm different, because that's what I do. But how do we make sure that everybody else Really, even if you don't use it, you support transit. And so when we think about transit, we should think more about something that is utilitarian, something that everybody can take advantage of, whether they ride the bus or they don't. Even if you don't use it, your children may, your mother may, your father may, you know, everybody can have access to it in one way or the other. So we're going to talk about your existing transit environment or what I know of it here. And please feel free to ask me questions or make comments as we go through this. Um, and then talk about transit ridership, the modes of transit, technology. I will share with you three examples from Michigan, from Arizona, and from Texas, and a couple of those I was involved in. And then I'm not a funding expert, but 
Usually in my line of work, they will ask us also, when you're planning it, you've got to talk, talk to us about potential sources of funding. And I will kind of talk to you about that, and we will conclude. So the tra existing transit environment here, all is really not that bad. You know, sometimes people think it is, but it's not all that bad. Um, one of the things that I, we, I did together with a couple of colleagues uh, late last year, we did a study of 15, 16 transit agencies in the country from California all the way to Florida, interviewed all the CEOs and one board member and uh, one general manager. What we wanted to find out was all these transit tax referendums. Uh, we just wanted to know uh, what's the percentage, what's the passage rate, and what's the failure rate. So we interviewed them. And then we compiled the results and we found out that out of over 140 some tax referendums that have been done between 2009 and 2014, there's a passage rate of 73%. And the question then is, why is it that we don't hear that in the newspaper? Why is it that the media doesn't report that? Then we realize that we focus more on the 27% that fails than the 73% that actually passes to do something. And so that's why I said it's not all that bad. There are certain things in this environment that we can build on. One of the key principles of smart growth is that you build on existing resources. You take advantage of what you already have in order to get you to what you need to, you know, where you're headed to. You will see five things on this particular slide. One is the fact that in this environment, there is a willingness by the political leadership to do something about the transit situation. I mean, again, I don't come here as often as I should, uh, but I've come here long enough and I read enough news to know that the previous mayor and the current mayor, they seem to push transit as a priority on their agenda. Uh, and so there is that political will leadership willingness. Then another thing you will see here is that there is a municipal willingness, a leadership willingness to also make transit priority. Nashville transit officials in the system, uh, state of the system report do agree there's a need to overhaul the system. I was sharing with my colleague in the office today, I, I managed the, um, the Grand Rapids transit system um, as a planning director. It's, um, it's much smaller than Nashville, not only in terms of population, service area, or even the number of buses that they have. But do you know that that small agency carries over 12 million riders? Interesting, isn't it? carry over 12 million riders. And um, you know, here we carry about 10 million riders. I assume that if you were to add the Music City Star to that, that would be about 11 million or so. Um, it's not something to sneeze at. I think it's still a lot. But when you compare um, you know, the system here to some others that are even smaller, they seem to be doing better. But yet, that's why the municipal leadership acknowledges the fact that we can do better. So that's a plus, in my opinion, because in certain environment, you will see a pushback from the transit leadership. No, we're doing what we can with what we have. We can't do anything better than this. But there is a willingness, there's an acknowledgement that there is a deficiency in this type of um, services that we offer, and we can do better. So, but you also do have willingness from the business leadership. The Chamber of Commerce is supporting this, They're pushing the agenda too. We need to improve the transportation system in the community. And then number four is that to an extent, some members of the community really want transit to be on the agenda, whether they want to support commuter rail or they want the bus to take them. You will always have cave people and NIMBY people. I don't know if you know what those are. Cave, right? Citizens against virtually everything. And then <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the NIMBY folks are the not in my backyard. I mean, you will always have NIMBYs and cave people. But I always, I've been part of four different transit tax referendums, and I've always found out that you don't try to convince the opponents. <coughs> you appeal to your supporters. And if you can appeal to your supporters to be passionate about the vision, and if they go out en masse, they are going to always succeed. Uh, and so if you have a small segment that is willing to invest in transit, to use transit, whether for the sake of their 18-year-old or for the sake of their 82-year-old uh, you know, mother or grandmother, it's a good thing. So that's why I said we have certain things working in the environment. 
The fifth thing that we see on this slide may be negative, but it is positive. Because if I were to ask you, I mean, a number of people, will, you will ask them, which cities in the United States would you like to visit? You know, people will mention New York, I'd like to go to New York. People will mention Seattle, I'd like to visit Seattle. I'd like to go to Chicago. I'd like to go to Boston. I'd like to go to San Francisco. I'd like to go to LA. But once, what is one thing that is common to those cities? Traffic congestion. I mean, why do people want to go to places where you can't even move in traffic? Because one other thing that is common to those places is public transit as well. And so they found ways to move around. I think congestion is good because it drives us to realize the fact that we cannot continue to outbuild ourselves. It drives us to realize that we do not want to be doing this. I lived in Atlanta for almost five years. And I can tell you that there are days I will call my office after having sat in traffic for two hours and I haven't even moved 10 miles, I will call the office to say, I am going back home. I'm going to walk from home. So I will go back. <laughs> you haven't spent 10, two hours, 10 miles per hour, just sitting in traffic. Now, if it was a two lane highway, I understand, but these are five lanes in each direction and we can't even move. And so it drives the agency, the community to begin to look for solutions. How can we do this? How can we move around? I was reading the news the other day about the worst traffic congestion in the world in China. Was it a few weeks ago, a few days ago? Yeah, you know, uh, people spent how many hours were they in traffic? It was awful. <laughs> you know, it was awful. And we don't want to get to that. But congestion is not always a bad thing because it drives us to think differently. How can we get out of this situation? And so those are five things that are really working here for us. The sixth thing that's working here at least has the potential to work is that you've got ready-made partners that are trying to push the agenda. Um, the Transit Alliance, of course, uh, we're here because of for, you, for you and thank you very much for that. The MPO is making this a priority. I happen to also be good friends with the Deputy Director at TDOT. Uh, we come from the same country originally. Uh, Toksomish, and I know that he is passionate about transit. Of course, from the point of view of health, um, you, you know, he's passionate. So you do have some partners that are really, uh, that form a potential for partnership. And one of the things I do in my work, I do help to put grant applications together for uh, federal projects, uh, transit projects. And one of the things that I have found all the time is that whenever you submit the application, the FTA, Federal Transit Administration, will always ask you, can we have letters of support from your partners, mm -hmm. from the mayors, from the city managers, from businesses, and all of that? Partnership is so important because you're not going it alone. You're going it with others. It doesn't matter the size of the agencies, but the fact is that some people are willing to work with you to bring a solution. And so that's also something that's working, at least from the leader that I know and from some of the conversations I've had, whether with folks in Franklin County or work we, uh, we're doing with the MTA or even a ride on, on this Music City Star, I know that there are agencies that are willing to partner together to make something happen here. And of course, you do have that. We talked about the fact that you know this. Um, the MTA has about 10 million riders. That's, that, makes, that puts the MTA not in the top 50 transit agencies, urbanized transit agencies in the United States, no. But it puts the MTA in the top 100 uh, urbanized transit agencies in the United States on the basis of ridership alone. Now I said something that just happened to the MTA in the last few months, which he himself may not want to talk about, is Steve Bland. He's a well-recognized face in the transit industry. When he left, we were not thinking he was coming to Nashville. We thought he was going to go to like a DC or maybe Boston, somewhere uh, that has, you know, that has the type of uh, environment that he was coming from. But when he came to Nashville, we felt that that's good. That's a positive thing because I'm doing work right now for them in Memphis. I'm actually managing and a high capacity transit feasibility study for Memphis. At the same time that Mr. Bland came here, the Memphis Area Transit Authority CEO position was also open. And they have a streetcar system in place. I mean, they've got some buses in place. And by the way, their ridership is a little bit higher. And so we had thought he was going to gravitate in that direction if he was coming to Tennessee. So we were kind of pleased that he came here. So you've got someone, an asset right here, in the state, in the city, uh, in his person. And I think the fact that you are a boss 
real system makes a lot of difference too. It does make a lot of difference in terms of the amount of federal dollars that can come to this region. Usually what you have, when you have a bus only system, you put a cap on how much federal dollars you can attract. But when you have a real service as part of your system, you increase your leverage just like that. And so these are things that we mean, we s you can see them all the time. So you may not necessarily um, think that they are assets, but they do uh, help especially when you go ahead and start asking for federal dollars. One of the things that we also know is that the Federal Transit agencies, uh, Agency or Federal Transit Administration likes to see uh, transit agencies as grant recipients. Uh, they'd rather deal with transit agencies or the Metropolitan Planning Organization as, as grant recipients. So the fact that you have MTA, RTA uh, under contract with MTA to operate their system is a great thing because then you do have someone that can actually bring that. And you, the experience with the ham shows that you can actually attract federal dollars. But it is what we now do locally that we, we need to work on. So we need to tell this story. I always say whenever I have an opportunity to present that each community has a story to tell. We just don't do it well enough. The people who say no have a very easy message. All they need to do is to say no to transit, no to taxis, that's all. The people who have the yes message found it so difficult to put it on the car sticker. It's a very long message. You know, yes, you can do this, yes, you can do that, but people don't often hear our stories. And we need to tell the story. Yes, ma'am. Can you talk about how you calculate ridership, like that 10 million? Where does those numbers come from? Okay, the question is can I talk about how we calculate ridership numbers, not just for the MTA, but typically how we calculate ridership numbers? Uh, those usually come from boardings. Every time somebody gets on, you calculate them. We do have what they call the APS, auto passenger system, that counts passengers when they get on. Then you have to really look through them very well to be very sure that you, know, you are weeding out certain elements. In addition to that, you will also put ride checkers on the bus, on the systems. Because sometimes when people get on, and they come out to go get something and they go back on, the auto passenger counter can count that as twice. And so you also have right checker on that will be clicking as real people come in, uh, you know, one time. So that's how we look at that. And the, the FTA, again, Federal Transit Administration, usually mandates that every transit agency submits a ridership count to them every year. Uh, this is the uh, 2013 ridership. Uh, because usually you will not have the one for 2014 until the end of 2015, you know, kind of like that. So this is what you have right now. It's likely that it's slightly higher, but it never happens dramatically. So that's kind of how every transit agency counts there. So it is 10 million in 2015? Yes, 20, 10 million in 2013. So that's 15, the 2013, 2013 number, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's the 2013 number. So no, they will have to review those and approve them, and they query them quite a lot. They will have to do audit, how did you get this? And they want to see the numbers per each bus route as well. And so if it's so dramatically different from last year, there will be a lot of questions, you know. <coughs> and that ridership is so important, which is actually what we're going to next um, in terms of what you do. Um, and what you can attract and actually how you, how you sell your market. Ridership is so important. So when you talk about the transit environment, it influences the number of people that gets on your system. If the environment makes it so difficult for people to access transit, ridership goes down tremendously. If the environment is only a bus-only system or a rail-only system, it also affects the number of people that you can account for. Um, when I lived in California, I, we bought a townhouse near a bus stop. And it was just a walk for me. And my family made a decision, we're going to buy one car. So we were a one-car household. And we were like that for 13 years. Um, lived right next to a bus stop. I would jump on the bus. And the bus would take me about five <coughs> miles down the street. And I would get on the light trail um, to get to work. I was one of few people who would do that. Because once you introduce inconvenience to transit, people are likely not to use it. People will tell you, we actually did a survey, and we asked people, will you use transit? 
And people will say, yes, I will. Then when you ask them, how many times would you like to transfer? <laughs> of course, it was still a good answer when you say, one time. <laughs> but the moment you say, would you transfer more than once? No. Because even one time is an inconvenience. And so I did that because, <coughs> not because I had no option, but because of I love what I do. And, and as a planning director, can you imagine sitting in the office and people will come to me and tell me what happens to their system and I can't even respond because I don't know what happens. You know, so I had to be familiar. There are days that my work was just to get on another bus route and just ride it because I wanted to know what my customers were experiencing. So that if I had to go in front of the board and they were complaining, I wouldn't be so ignorant. And so I could do that. So the moment you introduce inconvenience into transit, ridership goes way down. Um, there was a flooding situation in Nashville, the MTA, about 2010, mm -hmm. and about for four days or so, service was interrupted, disrupted, and buses were taken out. It affected ridership because I was looking at the numbers, and they call it National Transit Database, and anybody can access it, and you can go through it for the last 20 years. You can see how ridership was affected during that period. Uh, anytime you introduce inconvenience, disaster, disaster strikes, or something happens, it will always affect transit ridership. But there are certain, did you have a question? Okay, but there are, cert <laughs> there are certain factors that usually will drive up transit ridership. Uh, TCRP, which is Transportation Research Board, they usually put out these reports every time. And there is no update to this one. This is report 111, and it was done in 2007. Uh, but this is what we have found, and I don't know if you can read it, but I'll try to explain this. There are certain key factors that are so consistent to every system in the United States that has a trans, uh, you know, that, that's operating in a bus or, or rail or bus and rail. One, there's got to be population growth. There's got to be something changing. If your community is not growing, ridership is not going to grow. Otherwise, you're going to be recycling the same number of people. And that's happening here. People are moving here. I was just telling Stan that I have uh, the retired um, colleague from California whose uh, mother-in-law lives here in Nashville, and they are actually moving here by the end of the year. And so you're having people moving from all over the country here. And it's interesting because I was also looking at the student population growth at a couple of your universities. They are growing up. Mm -hmm. And so you see, it's happening. It's exploding here. And again, you are used to the community, and you may not notice that, but it's happening. And so whenever you have population changes, you have you know, um, the, 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 the dem certain demographics like the seniors or the millennials are increasing in number, you're going to have high transit ridership. I have a daughter who goes to Howard University. She probably knows more now about transit than I do because she uses it every day. And even when I said, okay, when you're done with college and you come home, we'll get you a car. You know what she said? I don't need it, Dad. Because I don't, I, I don't want to be buying gas and uh, paying parking, <laughs> you know. And she was just telling me insurance, registration, and all of those things. Because I know you won't do it, so <laughs> I'd rather stay here and use transit. You can see that the younger generation, they are thinking differently. As a matter of fact, millennials don't have to get a job before they relocate. They relocate first and then start looking for jobs. That's what's going on right now. So people come to Nashville and say, I'm going to find a job when I get there. And so they end up moving from Starbucks to Panera Bread, you know, to doing all of this until they finally land the thing that they want. It's happening. And we're seeing it in Charlotte. We were reading the news the other day. It was a few weeks ago that says that Charlotte is the, first, is the second fastest growing city of its size in the United States. Quite interesting. I mean, you'd lived in Charlotte couple decades, over a couple decades ago, is a whole different environment. I mean, I've, I've only been there for about three months, but I could tell the difference. I mean, you go out at 9, 10 p.m., and you see all these young kids walking around the uptown area, and they're so, I mean, it feels safe. And so you're having that happening. Then another factor is economic conditions. Do you have jobs? Do you have jobs? Are you able to attract people, and are you able to retain the people that you attract? It's very important. It's important that people find your community economically appealing enough that they want to come here. Transit helps, and that in itself drives ridership because typically when people come into a new environment, if they don't know how to find their way around, but if they can get a bus schedule, 
they will likely use transit if it gets them to where they're going rather than them getting stuck in the middle of the road. Sometimes people will do that. Um, my mother lives with us and each time she comes to stay with us, I get a bus pass because I'm here now <laughs> and um, I don't expect my wife to be driving everywhere she wants to go. But she tells me it gives me freedom. I'm able to move around wherever I want to go. At the end of the day, it allows me also to keep my job without having to leave work to go drive my mother wherever she <laughs> wants to go. You understand what I'm saying? And so every time I want to move into a community, I can help drive ridership up, not necessarily because I don't have enough income to get a car, but because for some reason it allows me to be able to do certain things. It can actually extend my distance of where I go to look for a job. We have found that to be very true. The travel conditions, we talked about congestion already is happening. The travel conditions, if you have congestion, it's a factor that eventually drives up ridership. At the end of the day, people get tired of sitting in the car all the time, and they will look for alternative. Uh, public policies and funding initiatives, we're getting there. I talked initially that you do have municipal leadership willingness to push transit to the top of the agenda. It eventually will affect public policies at the local level, which gradually will tip the scale at the state level. Many times we want to do something at the local jurisdiction, but the state frustrates our intentions. I have found things sometimes in Michigan, for example, the municipals were able to advocate for change at the state level. When Grand Rapids built its bus rapid transit, the state had to cough up 20% of that $40 million uh, ticket. And so we can affect what happens statewide if policies change locally. I left the last two to talk a little bit about them. Cost and availability of alternative modes. People don't have, often have to use buses initially. They may be comfortable, or trains, they may be comfortable using alternative modes as long as it's not single occupant vehicles. People <coughs> may be comfortable using bicycles. And then if they realize that their bikes can't get them as far, they will put it on the bus or on the train to extend their drive distance. And so we've got to think, which is another advantage I have as a planner. When I think about transit corridors, I also think about bikes and pads, being able to connect with buses. I think about bike trails. I think about trails. I think about moving people from trails to transit. I think about moving people from transit to trails. It's very important. If we don't have that, I don't know if anybody here is a city planner. I think there's somebody here from the city planning department. Yeah, all right. So you understand what I am saying. It's so important as we advocate for development, the right development. It's so important as we talk about public policies that we also talk about how people can get on bicycles or at least, you know, don't drive alone. Just find opportunities to carpool with somebody, find opportunities to join a van pool. There are transit agencies now that are beginning to talk about transportation demand management tools, <coughs> ways for people to get to work. It doesn't have to be on the bus. What we have found out is this. If people use um, carpool or van pool or bicycles, eventually they gravitate towards jumping on the bus or the train. Because you see, at the end of the day, what people are looking for is convenience. If your transit system does not offer me the convenience that I want, the likelihood is that I will not use it. I may see the station, but if I can't access it, then I'm not going there. And so it's very important. We're finding that it's very true. And then the safety of the system will allow people to consider options as well. It used to be that people would say, I don't feel safe on the train, I don't feel safe on the bus. But buses and trains are now installing cameras on. I was telling Stan that, you know, when I worked for the transit agency, I could sit in my office and I could see what's going on at every transit station because cameras were installed. So if I park my car, the park and ride lot, I can actually check that it's safe. Nobody has broken into it yet. Um, and, and some of us were given the ability to be able to see what's happening on the buses. It used to be that if you don't feel very safe, one experience can kick you off transit forever. But when people know once people start using these alternatives and they feel safe on it, they eventually gravitate towards using transit itself. And then land use development patterns and policies, as beautiful as our cities may be, sometimes that's what kills us. 
uh, when people go to Vancouver, British Columbia, and they come back and say, wow, it's a mecca for transit usage. People love Vancouver because it's beautiful. But you know why Vancouver is beautiful? Because you are going to see that the, the land use development, the patterns, it's not a sprawling city. It's a growing city, but growing smartly. And that's where we really need to get to, being able to grow smart. Um, I told you my story about being a city planner, then being a transit planner. So when I moved into Sacramento Regional Transit to work, they asked me to be the one to review development applications on behalf of the agencies. Um, I was a tough reviewer. Now I'll tell you why. Because I would see a number, of, a number of developers come in, and they just want to build these 250 units of houses. And they just wanted to sprawl all over the place. And I would see all these small little cul de sacs, you know, none of them connecting. So, if you're my neighbor, but I can't come to you. I can't even get to you. And you know, the problem is the roads are so small that our big buses can't drive on them. So already, you're already predetermined that this is a non-transit friendly community. So because I had that background, I would sit down with developers and I would tell them, I would ask them nicely, really, yeah. uh, <laughs> can you reconsider the development? Can you move the ones that are dense towards uh, the more busy corridors? Is there any way we can help you make things easier? We don't guarantee that we can supply a bus service to you in the next one year, but perhaps in two years we can. And by then you will have finished building. People want to use this. Um, so we had a project, it's called, you can Google it at some point, it's called Downtown Natomas Airport Light Rail, DNA Light Rail. The Federal Transit Administration like to call it dead on arrival. Because <laughs> Because it was a billion dollar light rail project, all right? And uh, we were asking them to, sub to, to pay 50% of it. And yours truly was a project manager on that. And so, well, we laid out this corridor with these stations identified along the corridor. And we also, we did something which you might consider doing, actually, here in Nashville. It's called Transit for Livable Community Initiative, TLCI which basically meant we, we took all the 40-something light rail stations in the system and we developed a different type of zoning regulations around them, a quarter to half my radius of the, each of those stations, we div different from whatever the city, the entire city had. But we grandfathered in existing uses. You're okay. If your existing use was a flower garden, you're fine. But if you're going to put a new development, you've got to comply with certain transit-friendly zoning regulations and zoning policies. So this downtown Natomas Airport line was a new one, and it was going through a new environment. But I wanted to impose the Transit for Livable Community regulation in this new area, because remember what I said, transit finds it very hard to follow development. If you can put it there before development hits, it becomes easier. So we had a developer that came in. I think it was either D.R. Orton or uh, one of those uh, popular developers, and they wanted to put this huge development around the station. So I said, all right, so a quarter to half my radius around this particular station has been zoned for multifamily usage. That was okay with them. They were fine with it. Then I said, the cost of the station is going to be $2.4 million, and we would like you to pay some of that. Um, and I was serious, frankly speaking. Because I thought that was a way we could also we could build our own 50% to match the federal 50%. Initially, they were resistant. But when they realized that they were actually making an investment and the return on that investment was going to be more than one point some million dollars, you know what? They wrote a check for it. That station has not been built yet because it's the project is still underway. However, there's an agreement between the transit agency and the developer that at a time in the future, when this station is built, the developer will contribute 50% of the train station, of the cost of the train station, because they knew that it was going to benefit their development. Um, I'm sorry, we keep asking this. Oh, question, no, it's all right. If, if this, you talk about development and having the buildings move towards a corridor. What happens if the street gets too, it's not large enough to handle that density? Are there any traditional studies, traffic studies, or engineering studies that can? make sure we don't overdevelop mm -hmm. in a corridor? Yes. So usually 
um, and I'm glad you brought up the question is, are there other technical studies like traffic studies that will determine if the number of houses or units of development closer to a corridor will not hurt it, but rather in the carrying capacity of the road will still be intact without resulting in awful traffic congestion. So in addition to doing that, we also ask the developer to do a traffic analysis, to do a noise study. If it doesn't work, we will work with them to have some type of flex design. So I may recommend it, but it may not work. But what we found out is this, that whenever you have our buses by nature cannot go on every street because I think a typical MTA, RT, a, 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 a typical MTA bus is about 11 to 12 feet wide, mirror to mirror. That's about the size of a road width. And so that's why you have a lot of mirrors break, right. uh, you know, and things like that. So, but, but when you come to neighborhood streets, they are not made for those. So usually what we will do is to also ask the developer to consider investing in a transpor transportation system management thing. Either they have their own shuttle system, that will be what we call cutaway buses, small buses that can actually take people. And so people will have an opportunity to use something other than drive on it. But we will not make that recommendation unless a traffic analysis result comes out to tell us that. If it does say to us that, listen, putting more units on this corridor is not gonna help, we back off from that. And we try to take advantage of something else within the development. So that's very important. I, and I think that that's one of the advantages that I bring to the table because of my background as a planner. So I will not just shove it down the throat of the developer. If I find that the developer is resistant, I want to find out why. It, it, it's not just enough to say it's too costly for us, but we've got to find out, is it going to benefit the community as well? And is it something that will bring an advantage to the transit system? And so at the end of the day, they work numbers. Because at the end of the day, what matters to a developer is the number, right? right? So we want to make sure that we're not kicking them away. We actually had a developer who left the city because he felt that the city was taking advantage of him. And so it took a while to convince him to come back um, you know, because of that. But you won't really have those. Anyway, so where, thank you for the question. Yes, sir. Question. What are your feelings about ride sharing services like Uber or Lyft? Uh, I know that MTA is mm -hmm. uh, partnering with So the question is, what are my thoughts about uh, alternatives like Uber or Lyft and um, rideshare uh, system? Actually, I'm glad you brought that up because I was supposed to mention it earlier on. So <laughs> I'm I, I, they work well. Uh, there's something we call in transit as the last mile. And sometimes your bus only gets you this far, but house is over there or work is over there. And people being able to use another method of getting to work or getting home it's good. I was just in San Francisco last week, and guess what? I took Uber and Lyft everywhere I went to. After getting on the trolley, I got out, take, uh, took Uber to where I needed to go because the trolley didn't take me that far. And so I, I think MTA is one of the agencies actually at the edge of working with them. In, in Florida, they seem to be. In certain communities, you are not supposed to operate Uber or Lyft. I think there are certain regulations against operating them. Um, you know, I don't remember now, but we actually were talking about that last week as well. There are certain communities that will flatly tell you, no, we don't want them because they're not safe for people and different things. And a lot of them are not also equipped with handicapped, um, you know, uh, equipment to be able to bring people who are uh, not able to physically get on. Uh, but for those who can, it's very, very helpful. Um, and so I think transit does itself an advantage by partnering with Uber, with Lyft, and other type of ride-sharing um, opportunities that are out there. I, 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 again, that's another way of driving up the ridership. Yes, sir. I, I guess kind of follow-up question to that. Um, we've kind of seen ride-sharing come, mm -hmm. come to our communities and others, um, and, and they're looking at now kind of taking that a next step further with actually incorporating commuting, the point-to-point -point commuting where you pick up people along the mm -hmm. way, multiple strangers in a, in a car in San Francisco. Yeah. Um, <coughs> is, there a, a, I mean, is there a scenario where you starting to see that as a legitimate alternative or competitor to traditional buses where maybe they, you know, it makes sense for them to pull up to a bus station, bus stop, mm -hmm. pick up a, a couple people, um, and, and, and in that case, is there an incentive, is there a reason to incentivize okay, Lyft? 
The, the question is really about integration of ride share opportunities into the existing transit system. Is there a way to do that? I think first of all you have to deal with, um, with um, regulations, you have to deal with a lot of public policies which may not allow that. I wouldn't encourage um, people sharing bus stops uh, with big buses uh, for the mere reason of safety um, issues, people getting on and then being hit by buses and all of that. Um, what I would suggest is that there could be, and we've kind of looked at this, and I think places like New York, Jacksonville, Florida, um, and San Francisco are really looking at this right now. Creating hubs that are for ride sharing opportunities, where Uber and Lyft, you know, they can drop off, they can pick up, and they don't have to be called Uber or Lyft. It could just be where taxi is. In San Francisco, the same agency that administers transit, although administers operation of taxi cabs. So for them, it's easy. They already have it down. Um, but a lot, these are happening in big cities. I think Vancouver and Boston are also doing the same thing. But we haven't seen that happening. And I'm not sure because part of the resistance we're getting from transit agencies is we don't want to take responsibility for those. Somebody else has to do it. Um, and they are also concerned that once you do that, they're not concerned from the financial point of view, and they're not concerned from the ridership point of view. But what they're mostly concerned with is that once you do that, are we liable for something? So it's about legal protection. So I was listening to someone at the American Public Transportation Association conference last week say that they're really looking at the legal implications right now. There will be some guidance that will be coming out shortly about how we can integrate that. Because you don't want to resist it. You want to embrace it, but you also want to be very careful that you are protecting yourself as a property. So I hope that helps. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, what drives a transit agency is it wants to be able to retain its ridership and also keep it growing. And anything that tries to make that difficult, there's going to be a little bit of resistance. And find a way, we do things traditionally. We, we even, even integrating smart card into our system it's taken a long time for us to embrace it. Uh, in Europe, I mean, they've been doing this for quite a while, but we find it so hard to embrace things because we have this old mindset of, we want to protect our riders, we want to protect ourselves. But riders are saying, I want to have that. I want to be able to use that. It's easy for me. But we're trying to uh, find ways by which we, cannot, we will not jeopardize ridership for ourselves. And so that's why public policy is so important uh, in transit. Uh, and we're really slow, I will admit that. Transit is really slow when it comes to things like that. But I hope we're getting there. Just the fact that you're asking these questions make me think that we really are getting close. And I think Nashville was actually mentioned, because Steve was in the room, um, Nashville was mentioned as one of the cities that's actually on the cutting edge of finding a way to integrate ride sharing into its system. And I don't know what that means, because I really haven't spoken to anybody at MTA to know what that means. Both the state and the city Mm -hmm. yep. so, and I think it's a response to the traffic congestion um, here. That's probably why. Thank you. Great, thank you. So these are factors that can actually influence ridership. So once you have the riders, how do they get to where they're going? We're familiar with these systems. Um, that one that's uh, the regular bus is the one we are used to, the bus rolling down the street. And when we're familiar with that one. I've actually taken both of these uh, right here. This is in Cleveland, that's the bus rapid transit system in Cleveland. That's the, uh, the one in Portland, the modern streetcar. That's your Music City uh, star. This is the one in Dallas, uh, and that's the one in Memphis, the historic trolley. And then, of course, we do have the electric multiple units that are used in Florida and used uh, in, in Virginia and a few other places around the country. So transit functions better when it offers people choices. Um, and you know they don't serve the same purpose. And so while this may stop, this may stop every block. This has to go at least every stop. And this will go longer. And so that's why it's an express service in a way, because it skips stops. And this has to stop everywhere. And this, of course, uh, it's almost like you have a light rail system, but running on rubber tires. And so each one of these systems serves different purposes. This, serves, this is more like a commuter system, of course. As you say, it's a commuter rail. It takes people from one place to the other. And so it, a streetcar will not do what a commuter rail system will do. And then you have this, you know, way advanced um, hyperloop and uh, personal rapid transit, 
We only have one of these in the country, and that's an old system in Virginia. I don't even think people remember that or talk about it. Um, a few years ago, HDR was asked by, um, by Microsoft to build one on their campus, but for some reason, they called it off. I think there was something that had to do with some software system that, you know, and so they called it off. But now we are being asked to look into another one in, of all places, Greenville, South Carolina. Um, they really seem to be thinking a lot about this because that's where Proterra um, is located. And so they are thinking a lot of outside the box as to how do we move people. Um, we've heard about pod cars that are really small, but when you think about the autonomous vehicle, the personal rapid transit, the podcast, the smart cars, they can only carry so many. Uh, but yet the convenience of being able to link people between stops, uh, and then they offer people the feeling of being in your own car, you know, you're in your own car, and rather than sharing car with about 100 other people who are smelling and sweaty, you know, you just kind of feel good that way. Uh, we have monorail at amusement parks, and and all that, and I know this is, this is a conversation right here now in Nashville, exploring bus on shoulders. Uh, that's working well in certain places, like in Cincinnati. Um, it's something that transit agencies are also very worried about because unless you have a barrier between the vehicles and the bus, <laughs> you know, they worry that the bus might run into someone or the someone might run into the bus, and, and then you can't stop frequently. You have to go from point to point. Uh, but they do work. And, and there's potential for them to work. I actually think that this is something we need to explore more, especially where we have wider shoulders, uh, to see where they can actually benefit people. Uh, because there are people who would rather take it and get to work rather than stop everywhere along the road. And I think that may work for them. So we do have this, and I'm sure that there are other opportunities that I haven't even identified here. But uh, we, we hear the maglev, uh, but it's a costly. And the speed obviously means that you've got to definitely be exclusive right away. Shooting between one place and another, and it's got to be far from where everybody lives because of you know, the distance, the accident, uh, you know, whatever may be involved. And so you've got to be very careful. Safety and security are a major reasons why some communities don't want to go this way, uh, because they want to be very careful what we be bring into the community. I don't think you can see this very well, but I will try and uh, share a few. What I've tried to do here is to create a table based on about 12 different uh, ex uh, you know, examples of transit projects in the country of a bus rapid transit system that's exclusive right of way, one that's sharing lane with traffic, a light rail system that's exclusive, another one that's sharing lane, and then a streetcar system. And I will just kind of share quickly the capital cost per mile for a bus rapid transit, if it's in its, in its own guideway, is between 20 to 40 million dollars. Um, the Grand Rapids one that was opened August of last year, 9.6 miles, built at a cost of 39.87 million dollars. So that gives you an idea. Um, typically, they're roughly about three million dollars. Um, you know, 3,000 at least you have to have 3,000 riders uh, per you know, uh, for the system weekday. And then if you were to build one that shares lane, it's about three to $10 million per mile to do that. And then the light rail um, is expensive. I think um, roughly you have anything that uh, between 60 to 100 plus million per mile to build that. And that's why people say, no, I'm not doing that. I mean, it's sexy and it looks really great. But when people know they have to pull out money from their pocket to do that, they kind of try to gradually back off. But then when you show the return on investment, it's great. We were told that, and I'll share this with you, the streetcar system that just opened in Tucson, Arizona, was built for $196 million and just opened. And the return on investment is already $800 million. So $196 million sounds a lot. But when you think of the return on investment, that is huge, um, right there for that community. Not just along that corridor, but the ripple effect of 800 million. The system built in Grand Rapids is a bus rapid transit system, but already there is more than $40 million in residential development along commercial along that corridor, even though it's only been in operations for about a year. So if we wait, there will be some significant return on that investment. Again, it serves different purposes. So ridership is very different uh, along this corridor. For example, if a bus rapid transit, uh, whether it's exclusive or shared, it can have between 40 to 60 people sitting in vehicle 
A light rail system, on the other hand, can have over 200 people using it. Then the distances that they go are different. You don't expect a streetcar to necessarily go up to 20 miles. You expect it to be effective up to seven miles uh, because it's a people mover, so it stops every block. Uh, some people call it pedestrian accelerator, just helps people who walk to walk faster. Uh, and so, um, <laughs> you know, so, uh, and, and it has fewer seats on it and more people standing. So that's, it, it's just very nice to have that feel. And then you want to have it in a downtown or in an uptown or a very dense environment. And then the maximum speed is different. Um, Carrie has this, so if you want this to be emailed to you, I'm sure that um, she will be glad to do that. But this I put together based on about 12 different transit projects in the country, um, you know, based on what we know. Yes, sir. Can you elaborate on the difference between light rail exclusive lane and light rail share lane? Okay. Who put a light rail train or rail share with a fast train? It will, be, it will mostly be cars, mostly be traffic. Um, usually the, um, the Federal Railroad Administration is very, very cautious when you share, when light rail shares corridor with freight train. They will ask you to have, because of the accident that happened, where was that derailment <coughs> now, for God, was it in Denver? Somewhere, they will ask you to have at least about 50 feet or more. And not every corridor is that wide to accommodate that. Uh, I did a, so a project in, f um, Lee County, uh, Florida, about two years ago uh, on an existing railroad where they were considering, it was a feasibility study for a passenger rail system and an existing uh, rail corridor. Um, the conclusion was that you can run it. You can share the same tracks. You can run it. But for you to do that, you'll have to have an agreement with a freight rail system that you only run it at the time they are not running. But most of the time, they don't want to do that um, because it's unpredictable. Uh, and, and then they want to make sure that they are exclusively using theirs. So when I talk about light rail in shared traffic, I'm mostly referring to traffic, uh, where the, the rails are embedded in street roads, and you know, cars can drive on it. And um, is, it, is that the same as trolley? Sometimes street cars do that too. The vehicles can sometimes look the same, uh, but they don't have to be. Street cars are usually smaller. Uh, in length, and then light rails are usually, uh, street cars could be one car, a uh, light rails could be two, three cars in a consist, you know, uh, to carry more people. Yeah. But they could look the same way. What city would have a light rail shared length? Shared length, Sacramento has one. Sacramento, Sacramento has one. Uh, Charlotte has one. Yes, that Charlotte, yeah. uh, Dallas has one. I would actually think most light rail system in the country will have both. There will be segments where they're exclusive, and once they enter the downtown area, they will have to share lanes. Yes, sir. Why is the job slash residence per acre so much higher for light rail than it is for BRT? Very good question. Why is jobs and um, residence per acre higher for light rail than it is for bus rapid transit? Bus rapid transit, for all intents and purposes in this country, is still fairly new. It's really over the last 10 years or so. The first one was in Eugene, Oregon, Link Transit uh, District. Um, but if you go to Latin America, I mean, it's, it's huge. It's, uh, when they say bus rapid transit, it's really bus rapid transit because it rolls like a train. It does everything like a train. And so the way we look at it here is that we, we don't have much dedicated lane. For, uh, Grand Rapids has about 65% of its corridor dedicated to bus rapid transit. And even then, that's during peak periods. Uh, and then once you start getting to non-peak, it opens it up. I say all that to say is the permanence of rails in ground that assures developers that you're not going to take that bus one day and move it somewhere else. So I'm going to put this house here or this commercial development here you know, so that's why it does that. Okay, uh, again, um, hopefully we are able to, to get this and be able to um, look at that. Success stories, I talked to you about, I, I mentioned that I was going to share a couple experiences with you. Um, these are basically cities in the countries and different transit modes, uh, but I'm gonna focus on Grand Rapids to Sun and Houston. And again, I know uh, it's five, uh, 15 minutes after five, so give me a few more minutes of your time. In Grand Rapids, I, I worked on this. This project was first initiated in 2001. 
and finally opened in 2014. How many people would like to wait that long, <laughs> you know? Um, but anytime you depend on the Federal Transit Administration or the federal agency to, to give money, you're going to have to wait that long. But it did not have to take this long. The initial plan was to have it built and operating, I believe, in 2011. So the Federal Transit Administration already agreed to pay 80% of the cost of, uh, it was what is called a, s a very small starts project. It already agreed to pay 80%, and the state already agreed to pay 20%. But the money to operate it had to come locally. And that was where the transit agency ran into some difficulty. So it meant having to go and ask people to increase their property taxes, called millage um, in, in Michigan. And so they had to do that. And when they went to the population in 2009, um, they were defeated. Uh, uh, by then, the money that was meant for the rapid, the story goes that that money was taken by the feds and given to Tucson, Arizona to build their streetcar. Mm -hmm. uh, because they can't be keeping it if your community doesn't want it. That's basically what the community said. We will not vote to operate it, therefore, you, you, we don't need it. Is this it. just a Michigan rule about raising the taxes? Yes, it's a Michigan thing that yeah. you have to raise that locally. The painful part of it is you have to do it every five years. If it's a uh, at if least. It's a BRT? If, it, if, it's, if it's a transit, it's, if it's tra actually FTA. it is anything. It's yeah. If it's really anything, you have to go to the community every five years for Small millage. Start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was very interesting. Um, because they had to do that. But I'll tell you what happened. I would think that the story, the success, um, the success highlight really behind this story is the fact that the agency was very persistent. So that we failed. Here's what we're going to do. We admit that the critics were right. The bus rapid transit, you see, because the transit, um, the transit agency, there were six different cities served by the transit agency. But only three cities were going to have this line go through them. So guess what the other three cities were saying? No. <laughs> Why do I have to pay up if it's not going to serve me? What's the need for me? I mean, that is a basic question. You know, what's the need for me? I mean, I, and I think it's legitimate. So what the RAPID did was to go back to the drawing board and say, what can we do to assure the other three cities that they are also part of this old game? So. We hired a firm called HDR to do uh, a transit master plan. They did this comprehensive 25-year transit master plan that not only say you can build this and connect three cities, but the other three cities can also benefit. There will be direct jobs and there will be indirect jobs. Not only that, there will be expansion of service span. So instead of buses ending their days at 8 p.m. or 9 p.m., we'll expand that to 12 midnight. So people who go to job in those other communities can actually be sure that they'll be able to go back home if Walmart closes at 10 or 11. We will like, improve the frequencies of service from 60 minutes to 30 minutes and 15 minutes. So when they started saying that, guess what? When they went back to the community in 2011, they passed. Because now people felt that there was something in it for them. Now it was a narrow pass, but a win it's still a win, it's still a win. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, so they were able to secure, guess how much? $13 million over seven years to operate the, the bus rapid transit system. And so the federal government gave its 80% and the state government gave its 20% and the system opened. When it opened, before it opened, we were projecting about 4,000 plus riders. I, I was talking to them yesterday afternoon. Just the ridership for the month of September, at the end of September of this year, was 80,000 riders. I mean, it actually blew our expectations and projections. I, I went there, I've been to Grand Peace about three times since it opened, and I rode the system each time I went. And I remember talking to this lady, because the system goes through a medical, an area called the Medical Mile, because it's almost a mile uh, stretch corridor where there are hospitals and medical facilities. And she said, you know what? I've given up my car. I actually sold my car. Now I come to work using this BRT system. I thought that that was pretty neat. I don't <laughs> think that I will go that, uh, that far because I've got kids. But, <laughs> you know, but for someone to do that, it shows that this is a significant improvement. And she said, I am saving money. I don't have to worry about parking. I don't have to worry about insurance and all of that. So there are certain benefits. What I'm saying is this. Other communities have done it. 
despite the fact that they failed. It can be done. It can be done. And, and Grand Rapids is as conservative a community as they come. Uh, but when people find out that there is a benefit to the investment, it doesn't really matter whether they are leaning blue or red, they will vote for something that affects them, you know, positively. Say dedicated corridors, is that, is that, did that involve construction or were those already lanes that you took over? Great. They, they involved repaving. They were existing lanes, existing lanes, and they were repaved and restriped. Uh, so that we say bus rapid transit buses only during a certain period of the day, and if people drove it, they could be fined. Um, so, well, that took away, um, the car. it took away, um, you know, if I had time, I would show you a video of it actually. Um, but it took away from that period in the morning, because I think it's between 6, 45 a.m. and 9 a.m. or so in the morning. Um, but it was only for a segment, not for the entire corridor. The federal government requires that in order for them to commit money to this, you have to prove that you will dedicate at least 50% of the corridor exclusively to run uh, this system. Uh, do not have to be all day, it could be a portion of the day. Uh, and so they had to do that. But I will tell you this, I don't know how many of you have noticed, I, peak periods are changing. Peak periods are changing. It used to be that we could define peak periods. Now there are people who go to work midday. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, things like this are changing. So I don't know if this is going to work on the long run, where we have to say we dedicate lanes during peak period. We've got to find some ways in which you balance people in traffic and still be able to run transit. Maybe that's another way where ride sharing comes in. Um, because you could have these small cars that could just stop and use it, and they don't have to have dedicated lanes. They can just move and then go drop people off at a particular place where the big bus will move them from that point. I don't know how we're going to do it. But right now, I tell you, it's working. It's actually not making a lot of money for the police department because they're not getting a lot of people fined, but it is working. <laughs> at least it is working at that point. Okay, so um, again, they have low floor vehicles. They have snow melt. I thought that that was really neat. You know, Grand Rapids get a lot of snow, and so they have snow melts at the station. And it, it snows a lot, and people can still feel very comfortable. Uh, and those stations are really beautiful. And they, we have another one. I, I talked about Tucson. Now, the story goes that the money that Grand Rapids lost at that time was given to Tucson, um, you know, to build this. This is, this is an interesting story because it's about partnership. This system was co-managed by the MPO, uh, the planning organization, and the city of Tucson. The federal government gave about 75 million of the total 196. A developer, Gaston, develop, Gaston Development, I think, gave another amount. I have a table that I will share with you there. Uh, but you see that $4.3 million to operate it was actually all local contribution. No increase in taxes, city general funds, fair box revenues, developer contribution, different things, they just pulled it together. I don't know, I haven't seen that happen in many places, that without any tax increases, a transit agency, or at least a city, can actually operate a streetcar system like that, probably in Portland. Uh, but you do have this, um, this um, three sheets of paper or this uh, sheet of paper on your table that uh, talks about how different streetcar systems in the country were funded, looking at different uh, innovative means of funding them. You can delve into them and read them later. Uh, we developed this for the Atlanta streetcar to look at different ways by which they could fund their system without having to raise taxes if you don't have to. Uh, it's just really a willingness on the part of uh, you know, the community to want to do something. But these are innovative means. Again, I'm not a financial or funding expert by any means, but I, I've prepared enough grants for capital projects to know that there are so many innovative ways. And we're working on the Wave Streetcar project in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. We actually started talking about savings from solar panels that were installed, that will be installed on the shelters. And it's amazing how much you can save by using solar panel. Um, it, it's, it's amazing how you can then use that to contribute towards your match. We talk about value capture. The value of a development around the transit system can actually be used to leverage part of your contribution 
you know, uh, uh, you know to what you're going to get from, from outside um, organizations to fund your system. It's really about sitting down, getting your banks involved, getting great financial experts involved. How can we make this happen? And there's always a way out. Um, and if we have to go to the public, then we've got to just wait for the right time to do that, uh, to get it done. But operations, transit agencies often say that getting the money to build the system is not often the problem. It is getting the money to operate it for a lifetime. Because then you have to keep going back and raising this money. And do you have commitment? Is that sustainable? How can that be sustained? In Houston, uh, there was a 1% sales tax that was approved in 1977 and then re-approved in 2006. Now, I don't know how many of you have been to Houston, Texas. And I don't know how many of you have read about Houston, Texas. I don't think there's any more car-centric city. <laughs> you know, everything about Texas is big. I mean, Houston is a sprawl. I mean, it's, it's huge. And, but for them, in 2006, they voted to approve that sales tax again to extend their light rail, network of light rail system by 26 miles. And each year was asked to build 5.13 miles of those for $756 million. And the federal government, I think, paid about 400 and something million out of those. And then uh, locally, they contributed the remaining 300 and some. So there is some willingness on the part of the people that if it's going to be a benefit, we, we, we would like to do that. The next table actually summarizes that in terms of you have a bus rapid transit system, you have a streetcar system, you have a light rail system. Like I said, in, in, in um, Arizona, it was $196 million. And look at all of those sources. They had to be looking for where to get this money. I mean, they had $2.9 million by a private company. There was a bridge that it was going to run on. And the improvement on that bridge totaled $13 million. That was considered as part of that $196. They had to get some utility dollars, about 8.5 million. I mean, they just had to look for different things. And then the city itself contributed 20 million. And then, of course, the operating funds came out of the city's general fund, the MPO subsidy, uh, and then some universities paid into it as well. So you've got to, if we have a corridor and there are colleges along that corridor, then you've got to start talking to them. Uh, a line just opened in Sacramento, a light rail system called the Blue Line. I just opened in Sacramento. Um, I think it was a few weeks ago. I managed it up to the time the federal government approved the environmental document and agreed in principle to pay 50% of the $270 million light rail system. Now, it was only 4.4 miles, but it touched two community colleges at two bridges. And one of the things that we did was to have an agreement with the community colleges to contribute something. And because it's going to benefit the students. The less number of parking they have on campus, the better for them, really. And so once transit is closer, it definitely helps. You know, so we've got to just look for ways by which we can, we can do something that everybody sees as benefiting the community. Um, you see also that in Houston, there was the sales tax that will make up the 7.69 million, the fair box revenue. Fair box revenues don't really generate so much. In their own case, they have some federal formula grants that they used, but the federal government paid 450 million of the 756 million, and there was the rest that was uh, from the dedicated sales tax, which we don't have here. Uh, but even without that, something can still happen with willingness in the community. And that's why we have to keep telling the story. We have to keep telling the story. Nashville is not a small city. It's a big city, and, and it's growing. And as it is growing, we need to start equipping the people within our areas of influence to tell the story. To build a great transit system, additional funding will be needed for both capital projects and ongoing operations. Someone once told me, your vision can easily become a nightmare if you don't have money. Um, and and it, it is true. You know, I mean, you, 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 no matter how great the vision is, you definitely need money. Many times, the federal government is ready to contribute. But they will not do it unless there's a willingness on the part of the local agency or the state to match it. And so this is the current climate here uh, in, in Nashville. This is MTA's operating dollars uh, and the RTAs as well. And you could see the two asterisks on the state dollars, pretty low, 6% uh, and 9%. Maybe the challenge is not how to up those. Maybe the challenge is how to up the self-generated one, uh, you know, or, or maybe the one that's local dollars. How can we push that up? 
but the point is we have a basis to start. And once you have a funding environment, I mean, one thing that's missing here is there's no dedicated sales tax. Uh, there is in Charlotte. Uh, and you know, there are certain other communities that have them. That's why Charlotte has a light rail system, a streetcar system, and it's expanded its fleet of buses because they have that to look forward to. And so as a community has a means of sustainable funding, it's able to realize its vision. Now, when you don't, things become very difficult uh, to do. So these are potential funding opportunities. I will not go through this because that's what you have here. Um, you can actually, the definitions are there on the first two pages. What does it mean to have tax incre increment financing? There are some tax allocation districts, hotel taxes, um, parking fees, some communities. When you have, when your downtown parking rate is so cheap, people don't have any incentive to take transit downtown. You yeah, just park pay $12 a day. I have places in Atlanta where you pay $5 if you come in before 7 a.m. You pay $5 a day. Why do I need to take transit? I mean, $5? I can do that. You know, and that's how most people think. But $5 a day adds up. And so after a while, you begin to realize, you know what? Um, if I come after 7, that $5 becomes $15 a day. And so, you know, it's, if parking is so cheap, it discourages people from taking transit. But if we increase parking, there's got to be a reason behind it. Can we take that increase and use it to subsidize some, you know, transit operations? Yes, ma'am. Can you give a real simple example of what tax increment financing would be to fund transit? It will be, you will, you will create a district. There will be, a, a if, if the transit system is going to run along a particular corridor, uh -huh. you could say that that entire corridor is a tax improvement district. Okay. And so you will increase the tax rate based on that improvement, not citywide. It would just be for that particular corridor. And then you create a tax increment financing, basically pay whatever tax you are paying today. Because of this improvement to your way of life, we're going to put this much on your taxes, if property you taxes. Tax if you already have, if yes. there's already a tip on it, yes. you want to, and you put another tip on it that's a different tax level? Yes, you, two yes you can do that. Okay. Yeah, you can do that. But again, you have to walk through the legal hoops to do that as well because some cities may not want to do that because people will say, but why are you doing it? Other people will benefit because the only people who use this system are not just coming from our corridor. So it, will, it should rather be city-wide tax rather than just, we're already paying some teeth. So you could, you could do that. Does, or anybody could do, does anybody do that? Do you know of anybody that does that? People talk about that in California, but I can't give you a, oh. an example, yeah. All right. And you know, I, I don't like to use examples from California well, look, because California. How, <laughs> how other people do it. I'm just yeah. looking for how other people might do it. I, I can get an example for you though because I know that we've done that before. Teeth on top of teeth. We've done that. I, so I'm not advocating. I'm just trying to figure out how it works. Oh, yeah. It it's can a, work. It's a lot of debt. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It is. How about uh, wheel taxes? Just property tax, sales tax, or? Uh, a wheel tax. Oh, wheel tax. Yeah. Hmm, interesting. I've never. Hmm, that's interesting. That's very interesting. I never thought of that. Never even heard of that. But that's something too. Our, our sales tax is, is pretty, is pretty high here. Yeah, well. almost 10%. So nobody is going to go for that mm -hmm. because it's already high. So it's got to be. That's another thing. People, when we did the transit master plan in Grand Rapids, people felt that their property taxes were already high. So here's what we did. We basically showed, okay, your property is $150,000 and it's going to be worth so much thousands in 20 years' time. Here's how much you're paying today on that property tax. In 20 years' time, this is how much you're going to pay. Um, if you pay that now, this is what you're going to have. And so that was why it lost the first time. Because when you start telling people you already paid $25 and you're asking me to add $15 on top of it for $40, and I may not even enjoy the benefit of this, then I may be dead. You know, people balked at that. Yeah. People, people balked at that. And so we had to go back to the drawing board again and say, okay, how do we do this? How do we do that? So we basically had to say, let's follow the state millage laws. Let's only do it for seven years. So over a seven year period, what will be the amount you will have on top of your property tax today that will give you the benefit of, because in seven years time, you may sell your property, you know, and uh, you know, other things may happen. People voted for that because it was easy to manage. So that may be the, the solution to TIV. Instead of doing it long term, we just do it short term. You said millage? Millage, yes. M-I-L-L-A-G-E. It's another name for property tax increase. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Can you go back to the last slide? Uh, the tax generating and property tax, 
23%. Yes. I think it's low. low? Yeah, okay. uh, because included in that is fair box recovery. To me, that basically means that the fair box recovery there is low. In some agencies, the fair box recovery alone is 21%. And so here, we're talking about self-generated, which means sales of tickets, not just you know, how much people pay. We're talking about advertisements on buses. So that 23% could be low. Could be, you could be pushing 27 or 30 percent in some areas, yeah. So if, if it's low or high, what would be the ticket price for something where the fare box is generating 23 percent versus a higher fare box? Yeah, that's. So the, the question is what would be the fare ticket amount in order to take that off? I was worried that somebody might ask me that question. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a really good question. You said? <coughs> yeah. Um, but you want it to pay for itself. That's the thing. No transit system ever pays for itself. Um, even as great as they are in Europe, they're still subsidized. Um, you want to be very careful you don't increase the ticket prices as to price people out of your transit system because then they won't be using it anymore. Case in point, when I lived in Atlanta, I lived in a place called uh, Duluth, which is by Lawrenceville. And one way on the bus to walk for me in the morning was $5. And one way back was another $5, $10, all right? So. I tried a few times to put gas in my car for $10, and I could drive that car for a couple of days. So I think that the more we increase ticket prices, even though that will bump up that percentage, we discourage people from using the system. So we look for other ways to do that, such as advertisement on bus benches, bus shelters. Um, now I think there are people who are actually, this is popular in New York especially, where companies buy stations and they put their name on it, such as AT&T. As a matter of fact, I think Steve had that in his previous um, um, agency, where they actually bought the station and they pay s some money, million worth of, over annually over a period of time. For Grand Rapids, we did a study for them, which we called um, Station Sponsorship to find out if it was valuable and if people will invest in it. We actually found that the hospitals were willing to have names dedicated to them. And there were certain, um, just like people buy, um, you know, they, they have endowments in universities and all of that, we found that people were willing to actually do these things for transit. And it, would gener it may not generate a lot. I think we calculated $500,000 or so. That's a way to bring that percentage up without increasing bus fares. But then you get to a point in your system where you have no choice but to increase fares. Uh, because maintenance, paying drivers, cleaning the buses, washing the, um, the, the train vehicles, all of those things cost a lot. And the, wider, the, the more your fleet is and the more you run them, you increase panel of service, the more you increase your operation and maintenance cost. So it's always a ba tough balance. And we've seen areas where, you know, you increase the fare, you increase that self-generated, but you also sell the amenities that go along with that. I mean, you're not mm -hmm. so harsh so you can read or you can do work. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that worth a, is, is that worth mm -hmm. a price? So value. Basically concessions, you're talking about having concessions at stations, not just selling them, but also having some things such as we did one in time when I was managing the transit oriented development where we said that libraries can put boxes at stations where people can drop books. I mean, you don't want to drive to the library after you get home to return borrowed books, so you take them with you when you're riding the train and you just drop them at the bus station or the train station <coughs> and they come pick them up or places where you could pick up flowers, or somebody to polish your shoes. I mean, it's not a whole lot. But at the end of the day, if you were to go through the, the subway system in <coughs> San Francisco, you got a lot of guys who polish shoes. I actually had, had a conversation with a guy who said, I have sent two sons to college doing this 
for years. I mean, it doesn't sound like a lot to you and I, but frankly, I thought that that was quite interesting. I'm struggling to send one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm thinking, that's serious. So you're right. There are certain things that we may not be able to quantify, but if I increase the value of ticket, I've got to also give my customer something that makes the experience worth it. Yeah. So th that is there. And we may not be able to quantify that there. Uh, some of the bus cards that we, some of the advertisement cards that we put on buses are so small that people don't see them. So people would rather buy bus benches or look at shelters and put something on them. But the whole idea here is this. We've got to find creative ways to generate money. And the transit agencies may not be the one to come up with those ideas. It could be us that will come up with those ideas. We don't have to lean too hard on developers either. And we don't have to lean too hard on our customers either. There's got to be some other ways by which this can be done. Yes, ma'am. When you put a public transportation line in, what happens to the value of the property along that line? Great question. Uh, what happens to the value of properties along a transit corridor, essentially? Uh, there's a gentleman by the name Dr. Robert Severo, uh, the University of Berkeley, uh, University of California in Berkeley, who did a study about uh, property uh, values along uh, transit corridors. Uh, when I managed the transit oriented development program for Sacramento, I actually did one like that as well, based on Robert Severo's study. And we found out, we did a number of things. We surveyed people who live along that corridor. Then we also interviewed real estate agents. And then we also decided to go back into the history of those properties before transit came and after transit. In every instance, it went up, except if there was a freight rail along that corridor because of noise. Yeah. That was the only time we found a dip, and it wasn't a huge dip. Because once you are used to the urban fabric, noise becomes part of the urban fabric. I mean, you kind of get used to it. People who live in Chicago don't complain about the L anymore because they hear it all the time. I mean, it's become part of their whole lifestyle. But I bet if they introduce that here today, a lot of people <laughs> are going to complain. Why? Because we're not used to that. And so but I would tell you, in every instance, we found it to go up. I actually can share the study. I can, I can send it to you. Uh, because I presented that revolution a few years ago. But it did not come up with anything that was new. It basically followed other things that other uh, researchers have found, that property values tra along transit corridors always go up. It doesn't matter whether it's light rail or streetcar, people will pay more to live along transit corridors. Yes, ma'am. We actually had funding for the AMP here, and it failed not because of a lack of money, but it was voted down because of an attitude. And of course, there were many different interest groups that were opposed to it for a variety of reasons. So in your experience, money is here. People are not willing, and you mentioned to ignore the fringe and go for the, the middle group, right? But I yes. Very interesting because um, one of the, I don't have time to share that with you, but I do have some slides here. But I was talking about the research work that we did about transit referendums in the country. We found four things that will affect how people respond to uh, sales tax increase on new transit system. Number one, you've got to build a strong coalition. Um, if you don't build a strong coalition, what happened in Atlanta will happen every time. Have you ever seen a place where the NAACP and the Sierra Club agreed to defeat a transit system? I mean, it happened in Atlanta. I mean, to defeat a transit um, uh, you know, uh, um, tax. It happened in Atlanta because, number one, usually Sierra Club will support transit <laughs> effort, but they felt it wasn't doing enough. And the NAACP felt we're happy, but it's not getting to where our people are. So, but the coalition wasn't strong enough to defeat that voice. So we found that anywhere you have a strong coalition build, it will succeed, number one. Number two, you've got to have the right messaging. Um, sometimes in an attempt, we're so enthusiastic about doing that, we really want to get the word out and do it, but our message get lost. And so I'm a transit supporter. But I lived in Atlanta through all of these things, and not one time did I hear the message that 
if you increase that, this is what it's going to do. But I found out over and over again as we talk to people and as we talk to transit agencies, people want to, you to answer the question, two questions. What will it do for me? And will it happen in my lifetime? If you can't answer those two questions, people are worried that you're going to use their money for something else. So if you say you're raising money for, for transit, but you use it for roadways, and then in, in certain cases, I think especially in Atlanta where people supported the construction of a tall road that they were told would be taken away after a few years, but when they started making money, they didn't take it away. They just kept it there. People had a mistrust. So the message was lost in all of these things. So the, we found that the right message is so important. Number three, and I think you have that here, is that you've got to have the right face for the campaign. You've got to write the right face or the right faces. It's got to be champions. Frankly speaking, it cannot be the CEO or general manager of the transit agency because that is seen as self-serving. So it's got to be maybe the pastor of a church. It's got to be the, the CEO that is well regarded. Um, in, in the case of Grand Rapids, <laughs> guess what? He was the Republican congressman who became the champion of a transit, um, uh, the transit tax referendum. You know, and it was very interesting. Uh, congressman Von Ehlers, he's since retired now. But I tell you, you know, I, I, having the right face who can share consistent message is very important. And number four may perhaps be the most important one, and it's the right timing. We found that over and over as we spoke to people, if you don't come at the right time, people will defeat it. Your message may be great. You may have a great champion. You may have a great coalition. But if you come at the same time, people are voting for police needs and safety issues and school bonds, people would think education and safety are more important than transit. And the likelihood is that they would dumb down transit and vote for those ones. So we find out over and over again that you don't want to go at the wrong time. There are people who believe if you go during general election, you will win because that's when transit advocates come out. It's not always true. Because when you go out in general election, sometimes there's so many people going that you get lost. Some other people also believe that if you go in May, when it's a special election, you may win. But to do that, you have to pay so much money to put it on the ballot. I mean, so you've got to know your community to know when. So I don't know what went wrong here, but the way I see it looking from outside, if you want me to tell you, yeah, tell. <laughs> <laughs> is that I think the project got out before the message. I think looking from outside, I think it's almost like the perception was you've already decided what you're going to do and you're now trying to sell it to us. It's the wrong way to go. I think even when we have a vision, and I think the vision that uh, the Alliance has is to have some form of rapid transit in 2020, something like that. You could have a great vision, and it's wonderful to do, but don't start moving ahead with it before you move the people with you. And when we interviewed board members, we interviewed communities, we interviewed CEOs and general managers who lost elections, they told us without fail that any time the project goes before the message, they always lost. And I think looking at it from outside, and I wasn't part of it, um, but looking at it from outside, reading the newspapers, hearing some of my colleagues from other consulting firms, that was really what I was able to decide from me that I think this project got ahead of the message. And people thought you already concluded that this is what we're going to do and you just wanted us to buy in. How do you balance that messaging with getting money, especially federal money? Because the reason they announced the AMP like they did, right, is they, ha they had to do it on West End in order to get the Tiger Grants or whatever it was mm -hmm. in order to get most of the federal money. So, and yes. They do it quickly because those grants mm -hmm. are expiring, right? So if you go through a big, long public process to engage everyone, which I think Probably you will not. So how do you, thank you, great question actually. How do you balance the messaging with the timing to secure grants, especially federal grants because they all have deadlines and if, if you have to respond in like six months or they used to call it shovel ready or whatever, something like that, you've got to be really ready to go for it. I would say the answer to that is r bad planning or poor planning and that is why, that's what happened in Grand Rapids. Um, we, w we actually brought the FTA administrator to Grand Rapids. I remember sitting in a restaurant eating with him and we were talking about how we we're going to bring this down and all of that. But then we already had a plan. 
Then we went to the community to sell this thing to them that, hey, we're building this $40 million BRT project. It's going to cost two point some million million to operate every year. You know, who, where, what? And so it was defeated. And so they went back to the drawing board and did a comprehensive planning. And basically, that comprehensive planning means that we identified different corridors where we're going to build a form of rapid transit system. And it's going to go this way, it's going to go this way. And I think that's what the in motion is doing right now. And after identifying all of that, we also identify how, what mode of system will it be? BRT will be here, streetcar will be here, maybe a light rail in the future. We identified all of those things so that whenever the federal opportunity comes, we have a project, even if it's conceptual, but the fact is that the, it's already out there, people know about it. And then if we now have the federal dollar, usually the federal government will not release that money to you unless you have public support behind it. In principle, you may get it, uh, but as you do your environmental work, you've got to have extensive public outreach. Part of one of, I, read, I think I read the environmental work that was done here, and it was quite interesting, some of the comments that were there, but I'm not really sure that those were taken into consideration in building, uh, at least in moving forward. Uh, so it's a tough one, but at the end of the day, whether you're planning it or you're building it, during your environmental phase, people have to be informed and have to be involved. I hope that helps. I know time is gone here, uh, but. Ty, we've done a wonderful yes. job. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.